Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us. I'm Mark Schumacher, the CEO of the Home Furnishings Association, and our webinar today is all about supply chain with uh, someone who knows this situation from every angle, Todd Wanick with Ashley. I'm going to introduce him momentarily, but just wanted to remind all of you that um, while you have sent in a ton of questions in advance, we want you to know that there's the ability on the side of your screen to send in questions as we go today. We will do our best to get to them. Also, this is going to be recorded, so if you'd like to share this after the fact, we'll be sending out a link to make sure that you can do that. Um, and I'm speeding through that because I don't want to waste a minute here. Um, I think everybody who's joining us knows Todd Wanick is the CEO of uh, Ashley Furniture Industries. And when we talk about supply chain right now, it impacts absolutely everything. It impacts what you have on your showroom floors, how you're selling, how you're communicating with the customer, the labor issues are, are really affecting how you can um, you know, get needed uh, furnishings into people's hands. It's, it's impacting everything. So as we talk about this today, we've got a lot to sort of unpack. But Todd, first of all, I thank you, A, for giving us the, the gift of your time today and also for being a member of HFA. But um, it's hard to know where to start, but I think I would just like to ask you, um, give, give every, everybody would just like to kind of get a sort of a, a state of the moment. Where, where are we right now in this nebulous, huge thing we call supply chain that's, that's all over the board? Well, I think our last conversation was probably about 12 months ago, wasn't it? It was. And, you know, we, we thought that we were definitely um, coming out of uh, COVID at that point in time. And, you know, everything was going to start improving. And, you know, there was a lot of changes that were certainly happening. But, um, you know, we were very optimistic about, you know, the ramp out. And, and obviously business took off, which was absolutely a fantastic thing. Um, I would say the state of the moment, if you look at it, is, is uh, definitely the Asia supply chain is under duress um, in a very significant way. And uh, we're just seeing a lot of factories continue to struggle to get opened. And, um, you know, we're, we're really at a, at a difficulty, uh, difficult moment. You know, um, if you look at where we are, you know, we're really probably in the process. I would say we're, we're probably at the, I'm not going to say at the top, but we're closer to the top. And we're actually in the process of coming down. Vietnam shut down in, in really late July, early August. A lot of factories got shut down the third or fourth week of July. Um, and many of them haven't even opened yet or they're in the process of reopening. So um, we're going to start seeing um, the supply chain probably get worse for the next three to four months and continue to uh, be under stress, specifically regarding um, import bedroom, import dining room, uh, wood veneer products. Um, upholstery looks like it's probably going to be in a better position, Mark, but um, imported uh, wood products look like they're going to be the most constrained. What are the indicators on a daily basis, Todd, that you really look at um, in trying to you know, gauge this complex issue? Are there one or two things that, that you really focus on? And, and maybe that changes throughout time. But I'm just curious, what are the indicators that you, you really look at? Well, we really look at, um, specifically regarding Asia, uh, we look at what's happening for flow of containers, um, what's happening for uh, vendor shipments, and that that's our biggest indicator and you know to give you you an example i mean we're roughly at about 30 30 percent of of normal right now coming out of asia um and we were probably 20 percent of normal um prior to that prior to this last week week and a half so um and we expect before chinese new year we're probably going to get close to 70 to 80 percent of normal um, anybody I talk to and know, and even our own factories over there, it just doesn't feel like it's going to come out of the ramp fast. Um, a lot of people have taken off and, you know, the supply chain's constrained. So my number one measurement that I look at every morning is how many containers loaded, uh, what kind of vendor capacity do we have? And that's on my dashboard. And what are we doing um, with shipments or what are we expecting for shipments this week compared to what we were really pre-COVID in, in Asia and Vietnam? And what are the biggest challenges in Vietnam right now? I, I mean, there's a lot of factors involved in these closures, but what are the things that, that are really impacting that the most? Well, um, if you go back to late July, the government pretty much shut everything down. Um, we were all forced to go into live-in policies um, in factories, and, and a lot of our vendors, as well as our own factories, had live-in policies. And just so you know, for us, you know, we basically put tents inside of our facilities uh, we had up to almost 5,000 people living in tents, and we still do. 
Um, so people cannot move back and forth in Vietnam. Now, Ho Chi Minh just relaxed their policy last week, but there was pretty much military on the streets. You couldn't even go to the grocery store. Um, you had to have a permit to go to the grocery store. And there was a lot of complexity around that, that the traveling and, and getting people to move. Um, they are starting to ease that policy today, but the biggest thing is, is there's no mobility in Vietnam right now. So if you're not living within a, within a factory, uh, we can't have workers come and go. Um, so we're hoping that over the next two weeks that that start, it starts easing up um, because our facility is in pretty much a manufacturing hub is not in Ho Chi Minh proper. It's in Bindong or areas like that. Um, that's where the factories be. Those are the industrial parts of the city. So when I say Ho Chi Minh opened up, that's great for offices and banking, um, but it does nothing for us in, in the areas where our factories are. Those are still closed down. And uh, we're hoping again that they start opening up, but people are unable to travel in those areas yet. And we're hoping in the next week or two, it's gonna open. And I think some people may not be aware of the fact that you've had to also invest in, in vaccinating those workers over there. Um, yeah. taking, the, taking that step of, of investing in, in that as well, um, just, to, just to keep business going. I mean, that's, that has to be something that you never could have foreseen <laughs> two years ago. No, no, and it was a very complex process uh, to be able to get vaccinations for our people. Um, but we're we're very proud of the fact that all of our people inside of the facility have received, received either their first jab or their second jab. Um, so uh, we're we're going to be fully vaccinated within the facility. But that again, that's not 100% of our workforce. That's only about 40% of our workforce. The people that are still at home, we haven't been able to vaccinate. Now we're communicating with them and telling them we want to bring them back to work. And in, in, in reality, they want to go back to work um, because there is no safety net like there is in the US. So when these workers are sent home, we have to pay them. Um, the government doesn't pay them, so you've got to pay them. And, and all businesses over there, not just us, you've got to pay your employees, even though you get no production out of them. So obviously that's, that's a right thing to do uh, because they have no way to buy food. Um, so we're happy that we were able to do it. But on the same token, um, they're not making their incentive pay. They're not making other things. So they do want to come back to work. Um, and we're hoping that when everything opens up, that we'll be able to bring them back. And they'll be able to come and go. And it's it's really, um, if you look at our workforce inside of the factories, it's almost all men because the women may have children. You know, Vietnam's got the youngest population in the world. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of mothers with young children. So they want to be at home with their kids. And I, I can't blame them. You know, I think a lot of people are going to appreciate having that a better understanding of the complexities of what it's like to do business in Vietnam. Um, it is a very different world, obviously. But let's, you know, we, we want to try and I want to I, I'll mention that when you and I spoke previous to this uh, webinar, um, you know, we want to try to find optimism where we can. I guess I guess Malaysia is somewhat of a bright spot right now, at least for the, the manufacturing going on there. Yeah, Malaysia's done a great job um, They're I think they're close to 100 percent vaccinated. Um, they're, they made dramatic improvements in Malaysia, but they shut the whole country down. <laughs> they right. took it down in June and they opened up, I think three or four weeks ago. So, you know, they're just taking really substantial, um, I should say making substantial policy changes and locking down those countries and they couldn't even go to work. They couldn't even do live-in policies in Malaysia. So it was zero, zero shipments out. But the good news is, um, they are pretty much fully vaccinated. I think they believe that they've got herd immunity already. And, uh, you know, we're pretty much at 70% of our normal shipment levels right now. And then the next four to five weeks, we, we hope to be at 100% of normal shipment levels because everybody's going back to work, which is exciting. That's great news. Yeah, we, 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 we got to have a little bit of a bright spot. Um, before, we, before we leave the Far East, because I'm going to bring us, bring us over to here uh, geographically and also with our conversation, just to, just to pinpoint one thing that you said. Um, remind us again what you really feel are the categories that are going to be the hardest hit and continue to be for the next few months. Well, number one, um, import bedrooms, the, the wood veneer bedrooms are probably the most difficult category right now um, because China had anti-dumping duty put against them. So China can't produce bedroom for the United States market. Um, Vietnam, if you look at a, at a typical finishing line, the line may have 200 to 250 people on and they start by building the paint and then you've got brushing and highlighting and all those things that go on. So you've got to get a staff in place to be able to run that line. And then you have to have social distancing. So they have to slow the line down because they can't have everybody close to each other. You can imagine 200 people on a finishing line, that's a lot of people and a lot of people really close. So they've had to spread it out. 
slow down the lines. But I really believe that, um, and, and everything that we're seeing right now is, is proving that wood bedroom is going to be a real, real challenge probably for the next six months. Um, wood dining room, veneer dining room that's finished um, coming from Vietnam or Malaysia um, is certainly uh, severely stressed. And um, again, same problem, you got long finishing lines. Um, wood entertainment centers are, are going to be difficult as well. Um, anything that pretty much has a veneer and a wood finish on it um, is is really uh, where the constraint is. And quite honestly, Vietnam consumes so much of the capacity of being able to produce that product. You can't really go to Europe because they don't have finishing lines in place to do the finishes that we like. They pretty much do a laminated product or a melamine product that's produced over there. Um, Vietnam's the, the real workplace for, for that kind of goods. So, um, you know, we're probably looking at Unfortunately, you know, a six month delay in the supply chain right now, it's, it's that significant, you know, and, and we've been communicating that, that you need to be telling your consumers that you need to be planning probably four to six months on dining room, um, at least six months on bedroom, um, that, that it's delayed. And again, if you look at late July to today, um, we're at roughly 30% capacity today, let's say. We had nothing between late July and today. Very little shipments coming out of those factories. And that's pretty much all wood bedroom, pretty much for the industry. There's some exceptions, but pretty much for the industry. And now we're gonna come out of this ramp. And this ramp, say you're at 30% now, let's say in four weeks you're at 50%. And by Chinese New Year, we're hoping to be at 70 to 80% capacity. And the reason for that is a lot of people left um, Southern Vietnam. Most of the workers there are coming in from the countryside, from central Vietnam, northern Vietnam, and they left because they were scared, right? They're like, I can go home and I can live on a rice field and be free, or I can live in Ho Chi Minh and basically be locked into my home. So they all went home, um, not all of them, but a lot of them. As a matter of fact, there's an article that just came out um, a couple of days ago that said 100,000 people have left, left southern Vietnam in the last four weeks. And, and to go back to their hometowns. So that's one of the issues that we're gonna deal with. So when we talk about the, the rent supply chain coming back up, even though Vietnam is opening up, it doesn't necessarily mean that the, that the factories are gonna be able to ramp their capacity enough to be able to take care of their demand. Um, so just, just, it, just what you needed were labor issues on both sides of the Pacific. Um, yeah, it, it's, almost, it's almost a perfect storm though. I mean, when you look at everything that's happened here, between container problems, right, which still exist, um, Vietnam factory uh, shutdowns, the government control, plus now you got a little bit of the employee issue that, that you got to contend with. And, you know, we're working hard to pull those employees back down, but until they know that they can freely travel, I don't know if they will, right, that everything's open and I can go and do the things I'm used to doing. I don't know if, if, if we can expect them to come back. And until Vietnam really loosens up, and they, they don't go back into another lockdown, let's say that they do open up and everything, if they, they get more um, outbreaks, that they don't lock it down again. Um, I think until that happens and the employees know that they're stable and then they'll come back to work. That's why we're kind of saying, probably after the first of the year is when we're gonna start seeing those employees come back. If um, you're just joining us, Todd Wanick is, um, is uh, with us today, uh, the CEO of Ashley Furniture Industries. And Todd, I'm gonna try to, you know, this is such a huge, uh, complex issue. I'm just going to try to take it in chunks. We're certainly going to get to more about about the customer impacts and labor issues, but let's walk it across the um, the Pacific for a second and um, and talk about our port situation because we could get all the product we need coming in to our shores, but if we can't get it off the ships and then to these distribution centers, um, we got some issues. So can you give us an idea about where that link in this chain is at at the moment from the things that you're hearing um, with LA, Long Beach, et cetera? Yeah, um, the West Coast is still quite a mess, and it really is. It's it's probably one of the big uh, big issues that I think everybody's having. If you're trying to get containers to the West Coast, it's definitely uh, a huge challenge. So, you know, really what we're seeing happen there, uh, Mark, is, you know, if you look at, at LA Long Beach by itself, you typically have three cranes working a ship, a ship to try to unload a ship, and they'll get it done in a day. Right now, because they just have a labor problem. There's not enough people to operate the cranes. They have one crane working a ship a day. And it's taken them three days to unload a ship when it used to take them one day. So they're basically at 
I'm not going to say a third of the capacity, but I would say it's 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 probably less than 50% of capacity what they normally operate at. And um, Seattle's kind of in the same place. Seattle's log jammed and Oakland's pretty log jammed right now. The time to unload a ship, um, the dwell time is between 10 and 14 days from the time it's anchored out from, from port. And then they bring it in, it takes three days to work it. So you're at least 17 days when that used to be three or four days when a ship came in, it pretty much got unloaded. And that's best case scenario. If the ship gets in and everything lines up, so um, it's definitely definitely an issue, um, but you know the U.S. ports are, are not really estimated to get better until 2023, and the whole container situation, you know, from the from the resources we have, are saying that they don't expect it to get better until 2023. Now there's a lot of ships under construction. I'm being told like 50 ships are under construction right now, 51 to be exact, and um, those won't come on anytime soon. Obviously, steel's pretty high. Um, other things exist in the marketplace, but there is more capacity coming on. But that's not going to really hit until 2023. So, with with that in mind, you know, one of the very common questions and all the pages and pages of questions from folks that are joining us today really surrounded that whole question of container prices. So, if I'm hearing you correctly, you don't see a nor <laughs> um, a, a, maybe a leveling off, but not a not a a, a real rollback of of some of these outrageous uh, container prices until 23. Am I hearing that? Obviously, things could change depending on the the economy, but but that's what everybody's saying right now. But they expect it's going to be 2023, and you know we try chart. We're we're in the process of many of you probably read about Costco and mm -hmm. the fact of charting their own ships. So we really worked hard on on how what do we have to do to chart our own ships, and and we're in early days of this process. Um, but you know it's ten thousand dollars port to port from Vietnam to a West Coast port per container to charter our ship. And, you know, we're seriously considering it, even though they're crazy numbers, just to move freight, but it's uh, it, it's pretty significant when you look at the cost of doing that. But yeah, it's expected that container prices are gonna stay high until 2023. A lot of companies went out and believe it or not, signed two-year deals, um, meaning they signed two-year contracts with the ocean carriers um, to secure freight because they're concerned they're not gonna be able to move their freight. And even at these high, crazy rates, they're out there signing two-year deals. And I'm talking about big companies, big shippers, you know, mm -hmm. that, are, that are signing those kind of contracts. And, um, you know, we're looking at, at a hybrid version of that and how we're, how we're able to achieve it. But certainly we're seeing this being very, very tight. And then Mark, when Vietnam opens back up, you're gonna have this whole sucking sound again, right? Which <laughs> is, you're gonna have a lot of people trying to get on ships and there's going to be a little bit of a challenge there. So um, thank God, you know, we're one of the bigger shippers in the United States. As a matter of fact, we're the fifth, fifth largest importer of containers in the United States. We got a whole infrastructure in place. So we have a lot of uh, clout and, and leverage with the container companies that, that we're, we're certainly great and, and grateful that we have these relationships. But we're, we are able to get on ships as a company and we work the system really, really hard. We've got a team of uh, probably 30 people that do nothing but work on bookings and and brokerage and everything else within our company. So, um, you know, we're making sure that we do get on ships when they're there. I know there's a lot of people who um, are are on this call who would consider $10,000 a container a bargain at this point, which is in, <laughs> insane, which is insane to think about. But, it's you know, really, I, you know, you know, the funny thing is, you know, you, you bring a promotional bedroom in, the cost of that container can only be $12,000. So the cost of freight just to the West Coast can be $10,000, that's nuts. So, you know, literally you're going to have almost, you know, a doubling of the cost of goods of that product to import it. So, you know, it's definitely, it's definitely changed the competitive landscape a little bit when you start mm -hmm. looking at the cost of freight. I mean, certainly U.S. manufacturing has a lot more advantages um, today than they've had in the past, um, you know, certainly at, at lower price point bedrooms and, and products like that. Do you, do you see anything changing in um, really the ports of preference in our country for inbound freight or is, or, or is that at, at this point um, a, a little bit too egregious from a cost standpoint just to start thinking about more of the southern or east coast um, yeah. ports? Yeah, um, certainly uh, we, we, I, th I think every port is trying to figure out how do they get in the sailing process because what you have to do is you don't just have to have a port, you have to have a container company that's got enough volume to be willing to go in there. So right. you know you got Norfolk, you have New Jersey, 
Um, you have the West Coast ports of, of Seattle, Oakland, California. And then you got Prince Rupert up south of Canada or up uh, south of Alaska in the, in, in Canada. Um, but those are really your, your big six in the United States. And uh, then you go to Savannah, which is a good port. Um, they have some callings, but not a lot. You know, you've got a lot of small ports in Houston, um, which Walmart pretty much controls Houston. It's pretty hard to, to even get on a ship to Houston anymore. Um, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's definitely a challenge getting the container companies to go into those ports. But I'm hopeful that that'll happen. That'll be the one thing that we'd pray for is that these other ports open up and that allows them to alleviate some capacity in LA Long Beach and go to these other ports and, and really develop those relationships. And, and you know, as we as we talk about this this process, let me ask you this. Okay, so you talked about the um, the difficulties offloading the ships in the West Coast ports. Talk a little bit about because everybody's also really curious about what does it look like from there out. Um, you know, we've known that going into the pandemic, we had a rail shortage and a truck shortage and things of that sort, and plus the people to operate them. Are we seeing yeah. any any positives there, or is that still a very weak point? It's a weak point. And, you know, I, I would say almost every part of the supply chain is a weak point right now. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's sad to say, and it's hard to even laugh about because certainly, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of stress in everybody's life, lives right now. Um, but yeah, the rail industry is, is really at, at a difficult time. Um, trucking is, is hard to get. There's, there's, there was a massive trucking shortage going into this pandemic and this just made it worse. Right. So trucking, trucking costs and, and, you know, we operate our own fleet, um, you know, got almost 1200 tractors and 4,000 trailers. Um, and we've had a hard time hiring. We are hiring, um, but our fleet has definitely been a big advantage for us, but finding a, a carrier to go from point A to point B is the hardest we've seen in a long time um, to be able to go and get truckload freight. It's one of the reasons why we've, as an association, one of the many positions we've taken is also for a, an, an easing of some of the driver restrictions um, to try to at least maybe get more people on the road or at least longer longer shifts yeah. because it's uh, it's been it's been difficult from a regulatory standpoint as well. But I don't want to I don't want to bog us down there. So let's um, these incredible costs we're talking about with the containers, et cetera. So now you have this is this has got to be passed on to some degree. So the, the real question here is, is that you have retailers of every size having to explain to customers the delay and the, the inflationary prices based upon all of these costs. So let's kind of, I'll let you, let you peel that onion however you'd like. I know from conversations we've had that the customer experience beyond all of these logistical things we're talking about is where success lies. And so, how are you how are you approaching both of those both of those things? Um, and you can pick either one first, whether it's be the cost or that communication to the customer. It's hard right now. It really is because of all these variables we talked about in the supply chain. You know, truck drivers, um, containers not arriving on time, people you know maybe not arriving on time, even inside of our own facilities. It's, it's definitely the most challenging I've ever seen to be able to make a promise to a consumer and to make a promise to our customers, our, our great real retailers that we do business with. And um, it's definitely been, been a big issue for us. But, you know, the biggest thing you can do is, is just be honest as best you can. I mean, this is just delayed. You know, I had dinner with uh, one of the biggest car dealerships in the Southeast, and he was telling me about even what automobiles are going through. And he doesn't know what to tell his customers either. Um, he's like, you know, you ordered a car in, in July and now they're telling me it's going to be December. Um, you know, are you willing to wait? And it's literally that kind of a conversation. And he said, um, I don't even think December is going to be real. It's probably going to be January, February, or March. And I've just got to continue to talk to my customers and communicate with them that here's the best knowledge we have at this point in time and just try to really get it at the point of sale. You know, where when a customer walks in a store, you're being real about what their expectations should be. And, um, you know, the expectations today are are very significant that there is going to be disruption. You know, we don't know exactly, but we're, we're, we're very, very optimistic that within six months, we'll be able to get this to you or seven, eight months, whatever you're comfortable with as a story. And just do your best to try to tell the truth and say what our responsibility is going to be is to update you as much as we can. And you know the problem that I'm sure everybody has is they're waiting for an update from me um, as a manufacturer, and 
I'm not even sure on some of these products, you know, when they're going to be produced because it goes back to when the people are going to come back to work and what the policies of governments are going to be. And I think that's really the complexity that we're all dealing with, but it is reality. And every company that, that does, um, does import wood bedroom is, is going through the exact same thing, you know, which is a lot of difficulty in the supply chain and, and dates that just aren't, aren't really, um, aren't really reliable yet. Um, I think in four weeks, they're going to become a lot more reliable and six weeks, a lot more reliable, and it'll constantly improve um, from here on out. How much is this? I, I just want to ask you this more as a personal question. How much is this just killing you? Because before this pandemic hit, you know, we were really pushing everything toward this world of immediate gratification. We want to get it in your hand. I want you in that, to your point about the auto dealer, I want you in that car now. I want to I want to get you that 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 bedroom set tomorrow. I know this is the reality right now. You got to deal with that. But is there still part of you that just is kind of like, am I going to wake up from this at some point and realize this was a bad dream? I mean, this kind of well, goes against where we were two years ago. Well, I've personally never been more stressed in my life, and you know, just because my my job is to satisfy all my great customers, and you know, it just tears you apart whenever you get somebody that that has a bad experience or you can't take care of. Um, it, it is really, really a hard situation and I hate it. I'm sure everybody hates it. And, you know, the industry really pre COVID was a lot more fun than it is today. And <laughs> there's, there's no question about it. I mean, right now it's, it, this is rough, but, but it'll get better. You know, it'll get better. And, uh, we're all learning a lot through this period of time. And, you know, I'm hoping, um, as soon as possible, probably not until the second half of ne next year, the supply chain starts healing itself. I do believe it's going to be that long um, before this really heals itself in a very significant way. Um, and it, it's got to be optimistic about the future. And the biggest thing is transparency and openness. And, and it's hard because right now, as I said, we don't know. We just don't know all the details of, of you know, talk about circle of influence and circle of concern. You know, I've got this big circle of concern, which is what the Vietnamese government's doing, um, you know, and, and how they're mandating, you know, what factories can open up but I have no influence, right? So I'm, we're all just kind of waiting for them to make a decision. So I'm used to, as, as I'm sure every retailer that's on here or every company that's on here is used to having a lot of influence in their supply chain. We don't have control anymore. The control has been taken away from us. It's been given the, the Vietnamese government has a control, the container companies have the control, the rail companies have the control. And you know, I'm hopeful that we'll get the control back at some point in time very soon and be able to um, deliver to our customers in the speed and reliability that we, we, we want to do and we want to achieve. So do you keep yourself from going too crazy by controlling what you can? I mean, is that great yep. advice for companies of any size is just make sure that you're really being good at everything else that you do have control on? Is that fair? Yep. I, I think that's 100% fair, Mark, and great point. You know, when, when you take a look at, you know, what's really happening in the marketplace, now you can either be a victim to it and say, oh my gosh, it's 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 tearing me apart and it makes me feel bad, which it does. But on the same token, um, what are you going to do about it? So you start planning your organization around, let's deal with the disruption. Let's be honest with, with all the facts, the brutal facts are in front of us. And then let's plan for when business gets good. What are all the things that were wrong and we've done wrong that we need to go and fix to become a better company? You know, I call it a reset. It's time for a rebirth or a reset. Um, for our company, and I'm sure every company is going through the same thing. If you're not looking at this time and saying, we just got disrupted in a very significant way, how should we do different things? And, you know, I, I sent you a note about what we've done. I mean, we didn't sit on our hands. We mm -hmm. opened up multiple manufacturing facilities, multiple manufacturing facilities, Pottsville, Pennsylvania, Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, Mesquite, Texas, um, Arizona is opening up in, in November. We got a foam pouring plant in Verona, Mississippi that we're opening up in November. And these are things that we've done. We opened up a bedding plant in the United States when anti-dumping duties got put against Vietnam in Sotillo, Mississippi. Opened up another bedding plant in North Carolina. You know, so we're not sitting around and waiting for things to happen. We've expanded our domestic case goods and put a ton of investment into automation and technology um, to make sure that, that we can onshore more to get better control of our supply chain. And we're ramping up our upholstery production as fast as we possibly can, ramping up our case goods production as fast as we possibly can. 
and we're going to be more diversified, you know, in, in how we approach the marketplace. And, you know, I think I've told you this before, you know, hire, hire global talent and, and locally manufacture. You know, we're going to be a localized manufacturer as much as possible. Now, there's things that we can't do in the U.S. It will be almost impossible for me to start a finishing line to make a bedroom set again, um, a, a wood bedroom set, sorry. I can make a, a, a laminated um, bedroom set in the United States very efficiently and effectively. But when it comes, comes to something carved and finished and distressed and detailed, um, that's always going to go to places like Vietnam. So what, you know, I think the, what you have to do is you got to think through a reset or a rebirth. What do you need to look like? What are all the things you learned and how do you change? And I've talked to um, single store retailers all the way up to you. And, and I, the thing I hear is that so many have said, we got to continue to have an, uh, a mindset of investing in the business, even, even during these kind of times, investing in a way that will, that will help, help to move things forward. Um, I, I think it's interesting. Great question that came in, which was, you know, um, about, you know, how do we gain customers trust back? And you've talked about the, the expectation of delivery. Can you give some insights and suggestions you have through what your team has done for also communicating the price hikes? Um, uh, we've found it interesting that now suddenly the entire country is talking about inflation when our industry has been feeling it for well more than a year. But um, are there, there are suggestions you have for, for communicating that as well? Yeah, so um, the price hikes are tough. And you know we've taken a 23% increase in our cost of goods since the beginning of COVID. 23% increase, whether it's wages, freight, raw materials. I've never seen anything like this in my life. You have a hurricane and it's a short period of time. Hurricane comes, goes, foam goes up in price, and then eventually it comes back down within four to six months. So you can kind of plan that and, and you can absorb it. But right now with, with everything the way it's gone up, 23% in costs um, of materials and, and labor and freight, it's just, it's impossible to offset. Now we've eaten some of it and we said, okay, we, we, can, we can offset some of these costs, but others you can't. So the inflation's here. I just read, a, read an article and they said that this next quarter is probably gonna be 7% inflation. Third, uh, the, the quarter after that are expecting 10, but they expect by mid 2022, they are gonna have a CPI of 20%. Now that, that's a big number. That's, that's a Jimmy Carter number. Right when you start looking at, at what's going to potentially happen, and they haven't identified the inflation correctly, you know I haven't shopped for groceries for a long time, Mark, but I had a chance to go with my wife, and I couldn't believe what $125 buys in groceries, and you know it's it's just crazy when you start looking at inflation; it's hitting every category. So how do you explain it to a consumer? Um, you know the fact of the matter is I think we were all selling our furniture too cheap previously, and I think many retailers I've talked to are are thankful that we are getting some inflation, um, you know, because their costs are going up as well. And, you know, I think the the big thing is, you know, we're, do I, I think it's going to stick for a while. And I just think you've got to do a great job just talking to your customers about the values that we do have. These are great values in the industry. I've been in the industry almost 40 years and the values that we have even today are the best I've ever seen in my lifetime. When you look at all the details that go into that product. And then if you go out and shop some of the higher end retailers like a restoration hardware, uh, pottery barn, you look at our product compared to theirs, I mean, it's, it's equal what you're selling in your stores and, or better in many cases. So um, I think that's really just, just changing the expectations and the mindset around what our own prices are. I don't think we'll see a $299, $399 sofa for a long time. You know, may happen with some flat pack product. But at the end of the day, I think those those days are gone because the costs have gone up. The cost of labor has gone up so much, Mark. So obviously that's had an impact. I'll let and you ask the question. Sorry. No, 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 no. You're, you, you, you've done a great job of, of, of segueing here. And by the way, not that I need to reintroduce you, but I, know, I love when people come in late just to let you know that that I'm talking to Todd Wannick, the CEO of, uh, of Ashley Furniture Industries, which, by the way, I, didn't, I, I just realized um, earlier today that next year you're going to be celebrating 20 years in that position which is kind of that's kind of yeah. mind-boggling as well um yeah. but let's talk let's talk about this one thing that that all retailers and manufacturers share uh, regardless of size right now is the impact of this very difficult labor market um everybody having to spend a lot more on on positions and having and doing that with a very small pool um 
insights into into how you all have managed that would be helpful and it's you know i know that some of it is just <laughs> jacking up the hourly rate but there's there's got to be more to that can you can you help us a little bit with the insight on on just where we are with this this crazy labor market yeah i think every company is is fighting this whole concept of turnover and what's been happening you know when you look at at our levels pre-pandemic um we were we're up about 70% in turnover versus where we were pre-pandemic levels. And there's there's numbers out there talking about the fact that 40 million people are changing jobs. 40 million people are gonna change jobs in the next um, 12 months. And just so you, you can relate to that, there's only 100 million people in the workforce. So you look at 40% of the workforce is changing a job in the next 12 months. That's an insane number. Mm -hmm. Now, what that tells you is, is they're not satisfied. They're not satisfied working for us. They don't feel engaged in, in work. And you know we're really working on how do we connect with our employees at a, at, in a better way? Um, because I want them to be excited when they come to work in the morning. And you know certainly you can jack up wages, but there's gotta be a way as an organization to change how employees feel about you, right? And it is an emotional bond. You can develop that emotional bond with them and, and they feel like you're taking care of them and they're engaged in the work. Um, I think that's the most important piece for us. I call it human flourishing. So if we can get people to flourish within our business, um, I'll just give you an example. When I went to high school, I had a guidance counselor, right? Guidance counselor talked to me and said, Todd, you're, you're gonna go to you're gonna go to a college and you know, let's talk through everything that you want to achieve in your life and and how are you gonna get there? Who does that in business? right and takes their employees and actually shares that experience and says i want to talk to you about where you're going let's talk to you about career development look at all the opportunities that we have at ashley furniture i know you may not be happy loading a truck you know and and i understand but we have all these opportunities you want to work in the office we'll teach you how to work in an office you want to be a supervisor or a leader or a manager we're going to we're going to teach you those skills to be able to do that and that's what i mean by human flourishing we've got to connect with our people in a different way. And it's not its not the way it used to be, and nor should it be, right? I don't think it was as effective as, as we think it was. Even though I say that our turnover numbers were less, there were symptoms there that, that showed us before that, uh, that we were doing a lot of things wrong. And now, you know, I think we've got to reapproach that. We've got to change how we deal with our employees and how we operate. You know, there's this company in Wisconsin, and he may kill me for saying his name. Um, it's Boston Inc. Um, and they've just re, they, they reinvigorated their culture and uh, furniture and appliance mark. And what he's done with his organization by talking to his people, working with his people, basically being a coach to them, not just him, but his whole team. And, and they're just seeing unbelievable results within their organization. And I think that's the gold standard that we all need to work on achieving. It's something that we should all be excited about is how do we engage our people? How do we get them to, to love us and love our companies and be excited about coming to work every single day? This, this uh, fight for labor isn't gonna end and it doesn't get fixed by pay. Pay is only part of the component. You've always gotta be competitive on pay, but we've all gotta focus on being the employer of choice. How do you become the company when they come to work, they, they love it. They love the opportunities you're giving to them. And again, not every job's perfect for every person, right? It may not be a right fit for that individual. Identify that and figure out what would be the right fit for. And that's really what, what we're trying to achieve as a company. Now we're early days on this process, but we know that we've got to, I talk about resets and, and reinventions. We've got to reinvent our, our employee experience with our company. Um, otherwise you continue to have turnover problems and other things. Um, they'll they'll be systemic. Society is more mobile than ever before, and it's flexible. It's mobile, and you've got to find ways to adapt to it. And I think what you've just said too is uh, is the case whether you have 12 employees or 12,000 employees. Um, yep. It's it, it, I don't think there's anything that's been you've said that's that's any truer than that. That's across the board. You know the interesting thing too. Um, Pre-COVID, heck, for as long as I can recall, you know, there's we've all known as as people involved in business that it's far more expensive to find new people than to retain them. So you're also talking about the fact of leaning on the things that actually are cost savings, that, you know, before you uh, you get to the end of that line. And and um, 
you know, that's, that's a, that's a huge, huge piece of this. And I also read somewhere else and love your comments on this that said the pay gets them in the door, but that so many of these employees are changing jobs on like the 89th day. So right, right when they get to that 90 day point, um, th that 90 days right now is, is brutal. Is there, are you guys finding that same thing? Absolutely. First 90 days, you got to onboard them, right? You got to treat them right. Uh, we're developing mentors within the business. So when, when they come to work for us, we have a mentor, somebody that could take them through the, you know, where's the bathroom? Where are all the things that I need to know? Where, where's the HR office? And somebody that can help them through that experience and, and also just be with them, right? And, and that's one of the big things that we're really trying to execute as a company is make sure that that first 90 days, they feel the love. They feel the love of being here. And, uh, you know, we, we treasure every employee that we have um, do they always feel that way? Maybe not. And and that's what we've got to change. And, you know, you, uh, I think for a, a company your size to say that you're reinventing, um, you know, if that's happening to uh, an entity like Ashley that has a lot of resources, uh, this is something that, that, that everybody needs to pay attention to. So I really appreciate your candor on that very, very much. Um, you know, I'm, I'm also curious about, since we're coming up on one, um, you know, we're coming up on, a furniture market. Um, yeah. The 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 question we is, <laughs> we are. Yeah, you know, I don't know if you've heard of them. They, they, we do yeah, have them. <laughs> but um, the reason I bring it up is this: um, What can the the dealers out there, the retailers, expect with what we're dealing with here? Is is much going to change? Uh, I mean, should, you know, normally, obviously, markets all about what's that new, the, you know, what are those new categories? What are the new things that are coming out? Are we at a moment where we're just going to see a, not a lot of change in that way, um, or will it change based upon what's available or the categories that are that are doing well? What does that landscape look like for the people trying to buy the furniture to fill their stores? Well, you know, our belief structure is, and, and I think I told you this before. You know, in times of war, prepare for peace; in times of peace, prepare for war. So, whether you want to say we're at peace or war right now, I guess I would say we're at war, and you've got to prepare for peace. And you've got to keep sharpening your saw. You've got to make sure your merchandise is right. You've got to make sure your, your, your stores are properly assorted. And you've got to know what the trends are in the marketplace. So, you know, as we do come out of this, you know, as I said, I, I think we're kind of at the bottom, at least from Vietnam we are. The U.S. is, is, is going to hit bottom here. Um, probably in the next couple of weeks, we'll start seeing it hit bottom. Then we'll start coming back up. But it will heal itself. This will get better. And you've got to prepare yourself for when it does get better and make sure that you have relevant product and and your your merchandising's right and you know obviously there's been a lot of price point changes so you know it's always good to go and understand what's happening with price points in the marketplace and to make make sure your style right as a company but i, I think it's um to feel like you can take a pause right now i believe is a wrong choice i think you've always got to be aggressive you've always got to be you know thinking through how you can improve your business and products part of it i mean let's be honest our biggest um, one of our one of our biggest experience that we have is a product that we have within our stores. And when somebody walks in, they don't want to see a coach a, a couch that looks like it's 50 years old. They want to see a new, innovative product with new colors. And we've got to keep reinventing ourselves around that. You know, so I you talked it's incredibly relevant for that point from that point of view. Okay. Um, and you know, and in talking about some of the things that um, that Ashley has done to. Um, really change when it comes to where you've got some manufacturing facilities and distribution centers and, th and things of that sort. How will that alone sort of change the, the, the landscape? I know that the domestic is not going to be as, you know, as big a player as, as what's coming from offshore, but how do you see these, these changes that you've made impacting um, the supply out there of certain categories, et cetera? Um, can you repeat that question? Sure. I'm just, you know, you you have um, you mentioned about how you guys have aggressively changed your operations and done a lot here in the U.S. A lot of those categories is is that while not the largest percentage of of what's being produced is is that are, are these changing footprints for companies like Ashley going to change that landscape too for for product that's going to be available you know domestically? I'm just I'm just curious if there's any any of these changes as we wait for the supply chain from from Asia to to you know sort of ramp back up. Are we going to see any changes? People are asking for some insights as to product mix and things of that sort. 
Um, well, you know, we're, we're the biggest producer of, uh, of bedroom in the United States. Um, you know, we have a huge bedroom factories in Arcadia, Wisconsin, and the Advanced North Carolina. Um, we're making upholstery in the United States and in every facility, continuing to ramp that production. As a matter of fact, over the next six months, we expect we're going to be producing 30% more upholstery in the United States than, than we did even pre-COVID levels. So okay. um, we're leaning really, really heavy into upholstery. Um, I think there will be some near shoring of other things, entertainment centers. We do RTA bedroom in the United States. Um, but, you know, it's really, really hard, Mark, to replicate um, a full finishing line and give you that, that depth of finish that you get um, from a Vietnam or some of those other countries. And even if I wanted to start a finishing line in the United States right now, I don't think I'd get the permits to do it, right? And, and it's, wow. it's just, it's a different, it's a different environment here. Um, you know, we're looking at Mexico um, for investment. So, so that's also in our wheelhouse of an area that we'll, we'll definitely be moving to in the next 12 months. Um, so, you know, we're, we're gonna near shore more um, than we've ever done. And uh, we've always been significant in that business, but you know, we're, we're gonna take more control of our supply chain versus, you know, making sure that it's, it's super broad. Yeah, th thank you for that. And that you did a, a better job of answering that than I did asking it, but thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, one of the things that um, has also come up in a number of the questions is this. What are some other sectors that you're, that you're looking at? Um, you know, we talked about home building. We know that there were some hiccups there as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you see as far as some of the other sectors that mean a lot to home furnishings um, that are either positive or perhaps a little, bit, a little bit negative right now. Um, people are asking about your, your sense of that. You asking about the economy and where I see the economy going or, or what? I think, I, think it's, I think they're asking economy and also some of the other things like, do you see us, do you see home, are you hearing that you feel home building is gonna be, um, is gonna be you know, at a, um, you know, ramping up after some slowdowns with costs of wood, et cetera. I think they're looking at what are the other, some of the other indicators, some of the other, yeah, uh, pieces of the economy we should be interested in to help kind of get a feel for where we might go with home furnishings. Well, Jerry Epperson, Jerry Epperson's been talking about this for quite a while about the fact that there's a shortage of homes in the United States, and when millennials go out and they they want to go out and buy a home and they're getting a job and they want to form a family, there's a massive shortage, and um, we're seeing that right now. This isn't necessarily COVID that we're seeing this big surge in demand of homes. You know, we're seeing a raw material price increase, but the demand is gonna be high for some time. So our leading indicators in the industry are incredibly strong. And, you know, we, we obviously saw people buy a lot of couches and things like that during COVID. But I think that, you know, as we look forward for the next two to three years, at least, and that's, you know, you can't look much beyond that. Um, certainly in the next two, uh, we should still see some very strong demand for the home furnishings category. And that will be driven by homes and and housing starts. So, you know, we believe that that sector is going to be strong. I do talk to a lot of economists and, and they're very bullish about 2022. Obviously concerned about inflation, but, you know, everybody's talking about it. Is this a temporary inflationary period or is it a permanent inflationary period? And some components are going to be permanent like wages and others are going to be temporary. But um, they're both very bullish on on 2022 and even 2023. So I think we're gonna we're gonna have a nice run. Which is there's got to be a frustration level in that too, though. If you had the supply readily at yeah. hand to meet to meet that demand, I mean that just has to be it's it's like hanging that carrot out there that you can't quite reach. Yeah, but but at the end of the day, you got to do the best of what you can do, right? And mm -hmm. it, you just do the best, and you constantly pivot, you constantly adjust, and and you try your best. And uh, I, I think that's what everybody is trying to do. And, you know, everybody in our supply chain certainly trying to do it. I mean, I've never seen people work harder in my life than what we're working now. And the whole team that we have, and I'm sure everybody on the phone can say the same thing. This is a, a, a difficult time, but it's a time when teams get stronger and better. And that's what, you know, I see happening within our company. And I think within our industry overall. A couple of um, other questions that have come in. I love getting a chance to get to the questions of people that are joining us today. Um, getting back to the whole um, working with the customer and customer expectations. Um, the question is, what values are best to mention to customers? Is it just about quality or are there other aspects of this that you think should be um, communicated to the customer to, to, to win back their trust? Um, 
Well, I think that the quality of the product is 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 the best it's ever been as well. Um, I think when you look at quality overall, whether it's drawer glide systems, finished drawer interiors on bedroom sets, cushions, you know, and, and the quality of cushions that are being produced today, um, you know, we we do a seat deck. We don't do sinuous sprains, which has substantially reduced our our quality footprint on on replacement cushions. Um, things like that, I, I think, are incredible attributes to products that we sell. And there is a tremendous amount of, of built-in quality within our industry, pretty much across every company. We do a lot of quality testing to make sure that our product is not just going to be sold into the home, but last. And, uh, you know, we do our best to deliver on that promise every single day. But, you know, as far as what you could talk about, I mean, you almost have to go through every single product and, and you know, there's tons of talking points around every single product category. Um, this is a great question. Um, maybe <laughs> I'm going to ask this though. Um, one of our attendees said, um, so where will Ashley be in five years? Where are the true opportunities? Um, it, every good business has a, has a, has a vision, I guess. What's, what's your vision for five years? Cause five years hopefully takes us beyond, beyond this, but where do you see it looking like? You know, that that's really an interesting question because if you would ask me 12 months ago or even 18 months ago, I would, I would have given you a dollar. So we're going to be X. Um, we're going to be an excellent company. Everything that we do, we're, we're going to be focused on excellence as an organization. And by that, I mean, whether it's the employee experience, the customer experience, um, all the product experience, we are absolutely going to change how we do business. Um, I don't know what the result of that's going to be in business, whether we're going to be up or down in dollars, but I'll tell you, we're retrenching and saying we are going to keep our promise. We're going to do everything that we can to, to control our supply chain and, and build it the right way and make the right promise to the customers. We're putting the new order management system in place because our order management system was, was written in 1997. So it's obsolete. And we went out and bought a new order management system from um, a company called IBM Sterling. And we're putting that in place so we can do a better job making the promise to the customer and then keeping it all the way through the supply chain. So Truly, I mean, our focus, and, and if you ask anybody about our company right now, and I've been on this mantra for a while, it's excellence. And we are going to become an excellent organization, um, which may, need, may lead to top line growth, may not lead to top line growth, but we're going to make sure that we do our best to become truly excellent in all those key components and key, key touch points. And, and we got a vision and a strategy around every single one. Now, I know that's a top down. You're not aware of this, but I know that one of your key leaders called me on a Sunday after having been um, at a loading dock with the team at 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning because they said, we got some things we're going to deal with here and we're going we're to take care of it now and didn't wait till Monday. Um, Good. That, that, <laughs> but I mean... Not but, that I wouldn't work on Sunday, but, you know. No, no, but but I think that's a great metaphor. Isn't that what you're, what you're really saying here? You just, this is about doing whatever it takes to be excellent. Right. It is really doing whatever it takes to be excellent. And being fully present as a leader, right? Helping the teams work through whatever issues they have and and really making sure that you're you're leading and guiding and 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 casting the vision. But you know, we 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 want to be an excellent company. We we talk about in our vision statement, we want to be the best furniture company, and that's an aspirational goal. And uh, you know, that's really where it comes from, and the fact that we are gonna focus on excellence and we see all these things that have happened to us and and all this chaos that's been caused in the supply chain and like I said, it's stressful, it's difficult. I, I, I wish it didn't happen, but I want to assure everybody we are working our damnedest and hardest to make sure that we can supply product to them and do it in a reliable way. Um, another question that came in um, relating to the um, issues of dealing with finding labor, et cetera. Um, this particular retailer has a real problem uh, guaranteeing that good final mile. Uh, that deliver that delivery piece. Um, can you talk a little bit about those challenges that you've also had um, getting that product from whether it's you or some of the, what you've heard from some of the home stores, et cetera, getting it um, to that customer's doorstep? Um, I know that's been an, also a challenge for this this lack of a labor pool. You know, it's um, really an interesting story because I've done this a hundred times. So I go into a distribution center um, that we own or another retail and I say, give me your best home delivery team and your worst home delivery team. I want to see them. Introduce them to me. And what do you think the difference is between the best and the worst? 
Now I'm talking about best, like 0% returns, right? 0% returns versus somebody that's getting 20% return. So what do you think the difference is every time I bring them together? And I, I can tell you, I've done it a hundred times and it's, it's pretty much the same every time. Um, I mean, my first, my first comment would be soft skills. Mm -hmm. The person every time that's at a, at a 0%, huge smile, ah. pretty, pretty clean cut, very articulate, um, well-trained and training is important here. You know, the salesperson, we take all this time to train our salespeople and teach them what to say, what to do. A customer comes in, what do you do? And we, we, we hire a home delivery driver and say, go in the truck and deliver this stuff, right? right? And, you know, it's interesting when you look at those personalities, it's a salesperson, right? So there's a sales process around that, that, that is really, really super important. And um, I'm telling you, just do it. Do it. Anytime you go to a re to go to a furniture store, say, show me your best and worst, whether it's salespeople on the floor or home delivery drivers. You need to be careful on how you do it. You don't want to say you're my worst. But I say, <laughs> why, why do you get 20% returns? Tell me, tell me what the reason is. Why, why do you get 20? Wow, you know, customers, customers don't like this stuff. And and the person that gets zero percent returns, like, I work with my guests. I do what they need. I move the furniture out of the room. And every time, inevitably, I say, how much, how much tip money to get every single week? It's a pretty big number for the guy that has the right attitude. The other guy doesn't make a lot of money in tips. He's like, you make that much money a week in tips? It's, it's unbelievable. There, so there's a, there's a fellow retailer who said, celebrate the sale that their yeah. delivery drivers celebrate. And I love that line. Does it, does that resonate with you? Yes, hundred percent. And, and that's, that's a, that's big. It's just don't don't just think that they're just delivering furniture. They're a huge part of the customer experience, and you know everybody just kind of leaves them. They don't train them. They don't talk to them. They don't work with them. They don't do the KPIs and share metrics with them. Before we stop, um, and I, I'm just, yes. I think we're almost done, right? I do want to yes, make sir. a call to an icon that we lost yesterday, Paul Broyhill. You know, and many of you had an experience, and hopefully you've had an experience to meet Paul. He was the classiest guy I've ever met in my life. And, you know, he always had a philosophy and he actually said this, I think it was written in the article um, that was written on it today, said, I had a great business, but I'm most proud of the people that I developed, most proud of the people that I developed in my company. And he goes, if I can take anything and feel really good about it for Broyhill, he said, that's the one thing that I'm incredibly proud of is the people that I built and developed. So I want to give a big shout out to Paul Broyhill, who is an amazing icon, amazing person. And he'll be missed. He'll be missed. And should, we, and should we all be so blessed to live to be 97, number yeah. one, which is incredible. Um, the other part of that, too, is um, downstairs in my house right now, there's a piece of Broy Hill we've had forever. And yeah. that name, that name is synonymous. You know, he, he not only created some incredible people, but, but a product, too. And I think that everybody shoots for that. I think, Todd, thank you for adding that in, because... We don't want to let um, these icons pass without without noting it because, you know, I think I've heard from many retailers that said we stand on their shoulders. I mean, you stand on your dad's shoulders. I mean, there's a lot, there's just so many key people that uh, that are so meaningful. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank you for spending this time and um, taking all these questions and um, and giving everybody some perspective on this. And I think the biggest takeaway for me is is that um, no matter the size of of the retailer. Um, everybody is facing a lot of these same challenges, but can also come out the other side by by doing a lot of the things that, that you're doing. Um, I also do want to mention for everybody on this call that yes, there is in 10 days, there is a market and high point. We'd love to see you if you're there. We have our resource center in the Plaza Suites building on the first floor. I have to make my plug, Todd. I just have to do that. But it's it, it's it's beautifully redesigned. And yes, you'll see some pieces in there that have been uh, uh, wonderfully donated by our friends at Ashley. I'll just leave it at that. Um, but we certainly want to see you there. So we would love to see you. And also, um, Todd is a member of the Home Furnishings Association. And I can say one thing about our team. We work every day to bring more value to retailers of all sizes because there is power in membership. So if you go to our website, myhfa.org forward slash join, we would love for you to become a part of this as well. But Todd, thank you so much again for the time that you've given us today and the insights. And on behalf of everybody, I thank you. And I just want to say what I always say at the end of one of these webinars to everybody, we wish for you good health, 
good sales, and we will see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Mark. All the best. You bet.